I am very pleased to present Deborah Pickrell, co-author of Frank Lloyd Wright in New York, The Plaza Years, 1954 to 1959. Ms. Pickrell is a media and journalism graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and she received her MA in Historic Preservation from Goucher College. She is a former executive board member of the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy and editor of its quarterly bulletin. Principal of Pickerel Communications, Inc., located here in New York City, Deborah launched her firm in 2001, following a career at media visionaries Condé Nast, Hars Publications, and Time, Inc., she has written for a number of architectural and design publications and has edited numerous books in the field and is also co-author of two other books about architecture and New York. Tonight, Deborah will lead us on an exploration of Frank Lloyd Wright's five-year period in New York, a time when one of the world's foremost architects and the greatest city inspired each other. The book, which received the Independent Publishers Book Awards Gold Medal in Architecture, explores the fascinating contradiction between Wright's often voiced disdain for New York and his pride in living in a great Manhattan landmark, namely the Plaza Hotel. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Deborah Pickrell. so much, Alessandra, and it's a joy to be with all of you this evening. I see many friends here and associates, members of the Princeton Club, and, and it's my honor to speak with you. My talk coincides with the Museum of Modern Arts exhibit, Frank Lloyd Wright at 150, Unpacking the Archive, which celebrates his 150th birthday and takes a critical look at his multifaceted practice. It includes more than 450 works made from the 1890s through the 1950s. How many of you have seen it? Okay, if you have not seen it, you only have six days to see it because it closes on Sunday. So maybe the talk tonight will inspire you to go. It's really terrific. Speaking of the 1950s, I want to take us back to that time tonight, to the last five years of Wright's life when one of the world's greatest architects and the world's greatest cities coexisted, clashed, and came together in the midst of post-war prosperity. From 1954 to 1959, while working on his seminal masterwork, the Guggenheim Museum, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of us, a New Yorker. His address was the Plaza Hotel on Fifth Avenue and Central Park South. From his rarefied perch, he had a bird's eye view of the city's most elegant avenue and a picture window on the seasonal splendors of its most magnificent park. At the plaza, he held court with the press, received the rich, famous, and powerful, negotiated with clients, and retreated with family. What was unusual about this was that Wright professed to hate all cities in general, and New York in particular, calling it a voracious mouth. <laughs> comparing its buildings to cruel rat traps and the city itself to a fibrous tumor. <laughs> he was relentless in his criticism and by 1954 his antipathy for Manhattan was crystal clear. But he was equally clear about his love for the plaza, which he called the only beautiful hotel in this god-awful New York. Despite his protestations, he visited the city regularly and enjoyed strolling Midtown streets with friends, dining at 21, and other fine Manhattan restaurants, visiting Asian art galleries, and attending the theater. As the late New York Times architecture critic Herbert Mouchamp observed, there was a discrepancy between the tenor of Wright's remarks and the frequency of his New York jaunts. When it came to our city, Wright's words were one thing, but his actions were quite another. In the years following World War II, America assumed superpower status, and New York became its preeminent metropolis. Building was booming in Manhattan. More than 50% of the country's licensed architects were practicing here, and the leading architectural journals were published here as well. 
Consumerism was also on the rise, reflecting new prosperity and optimism. The baby boom was launched, and Americans bought cars, homes, and furniture. New York was the epicenter of this consumer explosion, and Madison Avenue became its advertising hub. Long the center of America's radio and publishing industries, New York became the nation's television capital in the late 1940s and 50s as well, ushering in the medium's golden age. As art critic Jed Pearl observed, New York was also a world city of art and home to abstract expressionism, the first internationally recognized American art movement. Galleries, studios, and museums thrived. But for as much as the city was changing, one truth was immutable. It remained the ultimate proving ground for aspirants of all kinds. As the end of Wright's life approached, and without a single building standing on Manhattan's skyline, the architect was one such aspirant, irresistibly drawn to the city, and resolved to leave his lasting architectural mark on it. The 800 Room Plaza was one of the grandest hotels in a city of grand hotels. Designed in the chateau-esque style by Henry Janeway Hardenberg, it was conceived as a, quote, lavish pleasure palace, end quote, that quickly became New York's most prominent address for visitors and residents alike. When it opened in 1907, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Gwen Vanderbilt were the first to sign the guest register. Directly in front of the hotel on the Fifth Avenue side, a public plaza featured the Pulitzer Fountain and a statue of General Sherman, originally cast for the Paris Exposition of 1900. Immediately to its south, the palatial mansion of Cornelius Vanderbilt II once stood. Demolished in 1927, it was replaced by Bergdorf Goodman. The hotel had many renowned guests, including Princeton's own F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda, who took dips in the fountain. <laughs> Greta Garbo and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor who danced the nights away in the glamorous night spots of the plaza. For decades, the plaza, which enjoyed an enviable location on the southeast corner of Central Park, had been Wright's hotel of choice when he traveled to New York on business. I've been coming to the plaza for 40 years, he announced in a 1952 interview in The New Yorker. Surprisingly, Wright, an outspoken critic of nearly all architecture that was not of his own design, admired the hotel. Of its architect, he said, good old Henry Hardenberg, of course, I wouldn't do anything like it, but it is an honest building. <laughs> Hardenberg also figured in Wright's colorful version of the hotel's history. It was built by the Astors, Asterist, Asterites, the Vanderbilts, Plasterbilts, and whoever built. <laughs> They wanted a place to dress up and parade themselves in great mirrors, so they sent for the finest master of the German Renaissance style, and he did this. By mid-century, the hotel had become a comfortable habit for him, a home away from home for his personal and professional East Coast encounters. He often arranged meetings with the same familiar phrase, we will be in New York at the usual place, the plaza. Beginning in 1943, Wright's visits to the city became more frequent. That year, he received a letter from Baroness Hillary Bai, who asked, could you ever come to New York and discuss with me a building for our collection of non-objective paintings? Philanthropist Solomon R. Guggenheim owned the collection in question. 16 years later, the building would become the famous New York Museum bearing his name. Wright and his wife, Olga Vanna, were frequent guests in Guggenheim's luxurious, art-filled plaza apartment, located directly below the suite the Wrights would later inhabit. By 1954, as the Guggenheim project was moving forward and Wright was nearing his 90s, the architect needed a more permanent home and office in the city from which to supervise the construction of the complex building. The plaza, which stood 30 blocks directly south of the museum's site between 88th and 89th streets, was perfect for his needs. Characteristically, Wright chose one of the hotel's most coveted corner apartments for his home and office. There were few finer views of the city than the one from suite 223, 225, which you see here. The suite had an interesting history. Reputedly, Diamond Jim Brady, a New York financier famous for his prodigious appetite and penchant for jewels, once lived in the suite. Wright often referred to his redecoration of the space as Diamond Jim Brady Modern. 
in the late 1940s, during Conrad Hilton's ownership of the hotel, the suite was decorated by French couturier Christian Dior, and for a time was inhabited by film producer David O. Selznick and his wife, actress Jennifer Jones. Wright began to redecorate the suite in spring 1954, and although he had to work within an existing architectural framework, he would make the space his own. Entered through a vestibule off a hotel corridor, the suite was comprised of a corner living room with north and east exposures, and the east-facing office sleep space, a hallway, bathroom, and pantry, two fireplaces, and six tall windows further defined it. In an elevation of the living room wall, Wright annotated gold wall finish and conceived the round bevel mirrored insets for the tall arched windows. Behind each mirror, he concealed lighting, the dramatic uplit effect of which he suggested in the drawing. At first glance, the rooms are somewhat surprising as a right space and in fact bear many non-Wrightian features, including 13 and a half foot ceilings. Wright was about my height, and so the building scale was about five, eight and a half, typically. Decorative crown molding and a crystal chandelier all of which he had to honor as existing hotel features. However, closer examination reveals Wright's aesthetic preferences and design control. Wall surfaces were covered with Japanese rice paper, flecked with gold leaf set off by gilt frames. Shutters and trim were painted a rose hue. Floor to ceiling curtains were deep purple red and wall to wall carpeting was a surprising peach, as were the velvet upholstered chairs. Characteristically, Wright, a music lover, found a prominent place for his grand piano in the living room, and he adorned the space with treasured art objects delighting in their daily use. Wright designed numerous pieces of furniture for the suite, including his desk, a dozen three-legged stools, several tables, and an easel. Taliesin and Apprentices built the simple plywood furniture in Wisconsin, and the black lacquer finish was applied at a local body shop. <laughs> Exposed edges were finished in Chinese red lacquer. The office slash studio space was similarly finished, but its chairs, which dated to the Dior suite, were upholstered in plum velvet. A long easel designed by Wright held renderings of various projects, as well as a large oil painting, Pelvis with Shadows and the Moon, a gift from Georgia O'Keeffe, who was a friend and fellow Wisconsinite. In this room, Wright surrounded himself with telling objects, Asian art and artifacts from his large collection, fresh flowers, a set of sweets architectural catalogs, and a photograph of his beloved mother. Wright used the folding screen at the left to create a narrow sleeping area. The suite, which became familiarly known as Taliesin III, was captured in black and white by noted architectural photographer Ezra Stoller, whose work is shown here. Pedro Guerrero, Wright's personal photographer, took the only known color images of the suite. Both photographers caught the suite's beauty in moments of repose. What they did not capture was the bedlam of activity that defined daily life in Wright's New York home and busy office. According to one suite visitor, there was pandemonium going on almost all the time. Many celebrities visited the suite, including Wright's granddaughter, Academy Award-winning actress Anne Baxter. She received the Best Supporting Actress Award in 1947 for The Razor's Edge and was nominated for Best Actress in 1951 for All About Eve. And Pulitzer Prize-winning poet and biographer Carl Sandburg, who was an old friend from Wright's Oak Park, <coughs> Illinois years. The suite was also the site of many radio and television interviews and on one occasion served as a recording studio for the album, Frank Lloyd Wright on Record, by Cadman. The plaza's splendid public rooms and numerous amenities proffered many advantages for the Wrights, who often entertained guests in its lush palm court. But Frank Lloyd Wright's favorite space was the Oak Room, dubbed a German Renaissance tour de force by former plaza historian Curtis Gagey. For decades, Wright conducted interviews there with journalists, including New Yorker writers Lewis Mumford and Brendan Gill. Over a meal or his favorite libation, Old Bush Mills Neat, and if it came with ice and era, he would just flick the cubes on the carpet. <laughs> a relaxed Wright would expound on whatever would, uh, was on his mind, and his opinions would appear in the next issue of the magazine. 
Although he was comfortably ensconced at the plaza and enjoyed expansive views of the city, Wright did not like everything he saw. New York's burgeoning skyline was increasingly populated by the sleek new glass and steel buildings of the international style designed by the glass box boys, as Wright flippantly termed their designers. An organic architect who believed, among other principles, in intrinsic form and function, Wright abhorred the buildings and the fact that he never built an urban tower after a lifetime of designing them only compounded his ire. Park Avenue. The new concourse of American commerce was the mid-century showplace of the international style. Ushered in by Art Deco and Streamline Modern, these buildings were sparkling representations of the nation's post-war power. Wright, however, took a different view. A box is more a coffin for the human spirit than an inspiration, he said. <laughs> he believed these standardized buildings contributed to urban congestion and showed complete disregard for their sites, not to mention the indignation he felt for their architects. Though his prescient work had actually influenced this group decades earlier, he now found that they were his competition. Though certainly popular, the buildings had other detractors as well. While acknowledging Park Avenue's dramatic revolution, young New York Times architecture critic Ada Louise Huxtable also labeled most of its structures as stark glass boxes, shocking and strange, creating monotony and uniformity, reserving praise solely for the Lever House and the Seagram Building. The 1952 Lever House, designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill's Gordon Bunshaft, was the city's first all-glass curtain wall skyscraper, a built realization of the earlier imaginings of Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. While the cutting-edge building wowed Manhattanites, Wright dubbed it the soap building and a box on sticks. <laughs> Six years later, Mies's iconic Seagram building rose diagonally across the avenue. The first bronze-clad curtain wall structure, it was designed in partnership with Philip Johnson and in association with Kahn and Jacobs. Wright, who assailed Mises' less is more philosophy but believed him to be more of an individualist than his European contemporaries, was a bit kinder to the whiskey building, as he called it, terming it the best of its kind. Recognized as one of the world's greatest architects, Wright was not asked to design for the city's new corporate corridor Never one for committees, he said, architecture has never come out of collaboration alive. And he was rejected among design candidates for the Seagram building because of his mercurial temperament. Additionally, some felt that both he and his intricate individualized designs were past their prime. The roots of Wright's intense objections to the towers rising around him were established many years earlier when he formulated his own dynamic ideas for building tall, which he demonstrated for his photographer, Pete Guerrero, here at the Plaza Hotel. While a proponent of modern materials and the machines used to shape them, Wright advocated what he called plasticity, the total absence of constructed effects as evident in the results flowing or growing into form instead of built up out of cut and joined pieces, which is shown on the left. He claimed that international style buildings represented a return to the constrained post and beam construction of the 19th century. Call it modern, but don't call it new, he told a CBS television reporter during a handsome cab interview along Park Avenue. Wright's concept of plasticity evolved to become one of continuity form and function as intrinsic and symbiotic elements of a building shown on the right. We want them together. We want the poetry of the thing, he said, deeply committed to the individuality and spirituality he believed inherent to his craft and absent in the cookie cutter glass boxes. Wright received his first two tower commissions in the 1920s. 1924 brought the National Life Insurance Company project, an early glass curtain wall structure for a Chicago client featuring Wright's novel Taproot Structural System in which floors or limbs were cantilevered from a central steel and concrete core or trunk. The building was to be sheathed in iridescent sheets of copper and glass with adjustable windows and screens to control ventilation and glare. The conservative client abandoned the project and the building was not constructed. In 1927, New York clergyman William Guthrie, rector of the city St. Mark's in the Bowery Church, which you might recognize here, wrote to Wright, his longtime friend, requesting a design for an apartment tower to generate rental income for his church. Wright responded by designing three 18-story edifices for the site's park-like environment and another for the lot across the street. 
Conceived in prismatic rather than rectilineal form, the unusual buildings were designed with light, space, and privacy in mind. Praised on several levels by architectural record, the Times dubbed the buildings odd type towers in an October 1929 announcement of their plans. Ten days later, the stock market crashed, and Guthrie and his vestry members became increasingly skittish about Wright's unusual, unproven design, and it was shelved in May 1930. However, the taproot plan would provide the model for the architect's freestanding tall buildings to come. And some 20 years later, Wright's taproot scheme finally came to life in a Midwestern factory town. The 14-story 1950 Johnson Wax Research Tower in Racine, Wisconsin was constructed adjacent to the company's Wright Design 1936 administration building. It featured alternating mezzanine floors that seemed to float within it and was recently restored. In 1953, a second tower, the tallest of his designs ever erected, began to rise in another unlikely location, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. The 19-story Price Tower for Oil Pipeline mogul Harold C. Price Jr. was adapted, as you can see, from the St. Mark's design, reduced in scale and revised to accommodate business and residential spaces. Like St. Mark's, the tower was sited to best capture light with copper louvers to control illumination, reduce the use of air conditioning, and add lively dimension to its appearance. The tree that escaped the forest, as Wright termed the building, demonstrated a key aspect of his 1930s broad acre city plan, shown here in an illustration from his 1958 book, The Living City. It was also exhibited here in Rockefeller Center. The plan promoted the idea of tall towers and open spaces as part of a self-sufficient, decentralized community plan. Promoting an alternative to dense urban living, Broad Acre in some ways mirrored the nation's advancing suburbanization and forecast its mid-century sprawl. The offices and double-decked apartments of the Price Tower were conceived on a pinwheel plan that permitted flexibility of arrangement not afforded by the rectangle, according to Wright. Park Avenue's tall towers contain standardized workspaces that typically deprive those below executive status of natural light and views and mass-produced furnishings were the order of the day, think mad men. <laughs> By contrast, the Price Tower's offices, which varied in size, proffered views across the plains and natural ventilation, all featured built-in Philippine mahogany desks and lightweight partitions that divided office areas. Though construction cost estimates ranged to over $2 million at the time, or approximately $18 million today, Price Tower was remarkably unique with a form intended to transcend function and be touched with poetic imagination, according to Architectural Forum. Yet, even as the Price Tower was completed, the majority of Wright's 12 tall tower designs still remained unbuilt. Despite any broad acre proselytizing to the contrary, he became determined to define the urban tower of the future, glass box boys be damned. A 1956 design for the Mile High Illinois, which is featured in the MoMA exhibit. You must see what Barry Bergdahl has to say about it. It was a colossal $60 million, 528-story taproot tower resulting from a simple commission for a Chicago television antenna. His last gesture for a skyscraper, Wright said the Mile High represented the future of tall building in the American city. Though unbuilt, author Donald Hoppen described it as a great space marker heralding the 21st century, a technology and culture yet to come. Indeed, more than half a century later, building tall is a global trend that continues to escalate. Around the same time as the Mile High design, the popularity of the international style began to wane in New York just as Wright predicted it would. Though he wouldn't contribute a company tower to the city's architectural mix, he engaged in its commercial supremacy in other ways, including a showroom for foreign automobiles along the very corridor where the glass box boys were making their mark. Post-war New York. This is Macy's before the opening bell. Isn't this a great <laughs> thing? It was the epicenter of mid-century's happy-go spending consumer frenzy, fueled by the rise of corporate industry and an economic boom. With suburban sprawl proliferating and shopping centers popping up in every community, the car became the most valued commodity in this go-to-work-and-get-the-goods society. Austrian immigrant Maximilian Hoffman became New York's leading importer of luxury automobiles at a time when consumer interest was just beginning for them. 
In 1953, Hoffman owned three successful showrooms in Manhattan featuring vehicles such as Jaguars and Mercedes-Benz. As his business escalated, Hoffman began to hunt for an architect to design a residence for him outside the city. His friend Philip Johnson, whose designs Hoffman judged too austere, suggested Frank Lloyd Wright. The auto mogul and the architect got along very well, sharing a mutual passion for hard work, blunt honesty, and the design of fine automobiles. In December 1953, with discussions about his Rye New York house, shown here, underway, Hoffman asked Wright to design a Jaguar showroom for 430 Park Avenue at 56th Street. Though Wright objected to the modern building that would contain it, a commission for a wealthy client and the hub of the city's architectural action was too good to pass up. The 1954 Hoffman Automobile Showroom's beautiful photograph by Ezra Stoller was Wright's first permanent work in the city and one of his very few interior-only projects. The showroom boasted gleaming floor-to-ceiling windows and mirrored interior walls. Its central feature was a combination rotating turntable and spiral ramp on which six automobiles could be displayed. A signature element of several Wright designs, the spiral would be used most famously in the Guggenheim Museum yet to come. Though tantalizing, the expensive automobiles featured in Hoffman's showroom were largely out of reach for America's burgeoning middle class, for whom affordability was a key consideration. Continually interested in spreading his democratic ideas for modern living, Wright had an influential ally in this quest, Elizabeth Gordon, the editor-in-chief of House Beautiful magazine headquartered in New York. Gordon viewed her magazine as a propaganda and teaching tool and believed Wright to be the greatest architect alive. The two also shared an intense dislike of the international style. Gordon began to cover Wright's work in 1946, and the two forged a close partnership and friendship, which author Diane Maddox characterized as perhaps the closest ever between an American architect and a popular magazine. Gordon and her staff visited Taliesin several times. John DeCoven Hill, pictured at the right, was a former Taliesin apprentice who would become, at Wright's suggestion, the architectural editor of House Beautiful when James Marston Fitch left to join Columbia University's faculty. In an effort to further popularize Wright with the American public, Gordon was instrumental in conceiving the Taliesin Ensemble, lines of mass-produced home furnishing products designed by Wright and heavily promoted by the editor in her magazine. Though Wright had publicly assailed interior decorators as inferior desecrators more than once, and even outright disagreed with the use of several of the products, such as paint that would cover the natural beauty of wood, the potential monetary reward of the lines, plus the opportunity to expose a broad sector of the public to his ideas in familiar form sealed the arrangement. The Taliesin Ensemble was introduced in the November 1955 issue of House Beautiful, one of two issues that Gordon would devote entirely to the architect. A major feature announced, and now Frank Lloyd Wright designs that you can buy. They included a furniture line by Heritage Henredon, available at several New York department stores, B. Altman, Bloomingdale's, and Abraham and Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> Fabrics and wall coverings by F. Schumacher and Company and a line of paints by Martin Senor, including colors such as spring green and Cherokee red, Wright's favorite hue. Despite splashy introductions to the press, decorators, and the public in Chicago and New York, as well as heavy editorial and advertising promotion in House Beautiful, only the Schumacher line proved successful in the long run. It was the company's longest running license and was recently renewed. On several occasions, products from the line were employed in houses of Wright's own design, including the 1959 Cass House on Staten Island that included Schumacher draperies in a public open house. An example of Wright's 1956 prefabricated housing program, the Cass House was one of only 11 of Wright's prefab houses ever built in his sole New York City residential commission. While less than successful in garnering new architecture commissions in mid-century New York or in the sale of most of his consumer product lines, Wright was more effective in promoting his most unique and valuable commodity, himself. <laughs> Outrageously, fabulously quotable and in constant demand by the media. In a city that attracted a high quotient of the most glittering personalities of the day, he was a bona fide celebrity. He attracted several famous clients during his years in New York, 
many of whom he entertained in his sumptuous plaza quarters. Among the most illustrious were Marilyn Monroe and her new husband, playwright Arthur Miller. In his autobiography, Miller claimed it was Monroe's idea to contact Wright to design their dream home. And in fact, her path had tangentially crossed Wright's before in 1950. She appeared in the film All About Eve with Wright's granddaughter, actress Ann Baxter. And in 1953, she honeymooned with her then husband, baseball legend Joe DiMaggio, in the Architects Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. This is one of the projects featured in the MoMA exhibit as well. Monroe came to Wright's Plaza apartment more than once, and each time a flabbergasted apprentice greeted her at the door. Wright rarely announced her appointments. He whisked the actress into his office and banned others from the room. He dispatched apprentices on errands and sent his wife out shopping. <laughs> As one observer noted, Wright just wanted to have any beautiful woman to himself. The Millers wanted to build a house on their farmland in rural Roxbury, Connecticut. In 1957, Wright accompanied the couple to the property. Once on site, Miller explained that he and Monroe did not want, quote, some elaborate house with which to impress the world, end quote, but rather one that reflected their desire to live simply. Later, Miller recalled that this news had not the slightest interest to Wright. Of the existing farmhouse on the site, Wright advised, don't put a nickel into it. The scheme proposed was neither simple nor new. In fact, it was a reinterpretation of two recent unbuilt designs for clients in Fort Worth, Texas and Acapulco, Mexico. The proposed design featured a large house with a circular living room 60 feet in diameter, complete with a projection booth, retractable movie screen, and a massive chandelier. Two wings, which angled off the space, contained a conservatory, library, card room, guest and servant and chauffeur quarters, in addition to basic living spaces. The house was to be built of local field stone and roofed with a thin concrete dome sheathed with gold aluminum. Wright also proposed a swimming pool supported by a massive retaining wall that Miller feared would require heavy construction along the lines of the Maginot Line to achieve. <laughs> Upon viewing Wright's watercolor fantasy of the house, Miller immediately deemed the plans inappropriate for their lifestyle and their site. He objected to the ostentatious scheme and feared the pool alone would consume the projected budget of $250,000. The Millers <laughs> abandoned the project. By 1958, the couple's marriage was crumbling. They divorced in 1961, and Moreau died in 1962. Sadly, there would be no dream house for the Millers by Wright or anyone else. Wright's marketability and draw as a celebrity, however, led to a 1957 collaboration with theater impresario Mike Todd. Industrialist Henry J. Kaiser and former NBC president Sylvester Pat Weaver, who was the father of actress Sigourney Weaver. At the time, Todd was an Academy Award winning producer of Around the World in 80 Days, the husband of actress Elizabeth Taylor and the pioneer of the groundbreaking widescreen film projection system called Todd A.O. He had hit upon the idea of showing his films in a chain of Todd A.O. movie theaters located in America's new shopping centers where parking would be abundant. Kaiser, who had recently built an aluminum dome theater in Hawaii based on Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome, became a partner in the project. Todd planned to adopt the dome for his mass market needs and to revolutionize the theater business in the process. Brilliant structural innovator though he was, Fuller was not a household name, so sensing the marketing potential of the project, Todd, Kaiser, and Weaver wanted a high profile architect known to the American public to design the project. Citing his flamboyance and ability to attract attention, they selected Wright. Wright was contracted to design the understructure of the dome, but characteristically expanded his commission. He proposed precast concrete shells to support the domed roof, which he designed with a gentler curve. The four men held their only face-to-face -face meeting in Wright's plaza suite. By January 1958, Wright had prepared drawings that he suggested had many virtues. Comparing them to Todd's stunning wife, he wrote, Love to Elizabeth, but the new Michael Todd Theater is almost as beautiful and will last longer. <laughs> Todd said he would stop in Phoenix to review the drawings on his next trip to the West Coast. 
Tragically, he never saw the drawings. Two weeks later, he perished when his private plane, the Liz, crashed in New Mexico. Although the remaining partners tried to carry on, any hope of realizing Mike Todd Theater died along with its colorful conjurer. Yet, as Todd had predicted, the concept of building movie theaters and shopping malls did become ubiquitous and revolutionized the theater business in the process. William Zeckendorf was a celebrity of a different kind. Described as an oversized bulldog of a man and a caricature of the jowly, big-bellied real estate operator, he was the wealthy and powerful New York real estate tycoon who put the land deal together for the United Nations. Wright and Zeckendorf's first meeting was a televised debate on NBC's American Forum of the Air, where they battled about the future of the metropolis, with Wright arguing the obsolescence of American cities and Zeckendorf promoting their revitalization through urban renewal. Publicly, Wright hurled all kinds of insults at the tycoon and coined the term Zeckendorf's as a derogatory term for big city developers. But thanks to Zeckendorf's generous and forgiving nature, the two men privately enjoyed a warm friendship. Although they never built a project together, preliminary plans were developed for a motor hotel for a 25-acre plot of land in New York. And most significantly, Zeckendorf, who had many interests in Chicago, saved the Roby House. Wright's Prairie School masterwork by purchasing it for $125,000 when its owner, the Chicago Theological Seminary, threatened to raise it in 1957 to make room for a dorm. A grateful Wright designed a plaque for the house that read, Save from Destruction by William Zeckendorf, American Builder, certainly the highest compliment he ever paid a realtor. In the 1950s, the vast majority of America's shows were televised from New York studios, and Wright was able to enhance his celebrity and extend his promotional reach through the popular new medium. These are members of the public watching Queen Elizabeth's coronation in Rockefeller Center. Wright and television were perfectly suited to each other. Although he was an elderly man and television was young, both were brash, bold purveyors of experimental ideas first appearing, as he is here, on the BBC in London in 1939. Wright, a born proselytizer, proved himself to be a natural on the small screen. One of his earliest nationally televised appearances was NBC's Conversations with Elder Wiseman, which aired on May 17, 1953. The show, which was the brainchild of Sylvester Weaver, strived to showcase the world's greatest thinkers. The series was hosted by 32-year-old Hugh Downs, seen sitting here in a very low chair. <laughs> Famously, during this interview, Wright said, early in life I had to choose between honest arrogance and hypocritical humility. I chose arrogance and I see no reason to change. <laughs> Downs later recalled two things about the man. He did not waste a lot of effort on the lubrication of fact. He was a genius, no doubt about it. That same week, Wright also appeared on the Today Show, which was hosted by Dave Garraway. During the interview, he prophesied about many things, including his prediction that the city would move to the country and grass would be growing in the streets of New York in 25 years. <laughs> but he also demonstrated a remarkable grasp for the black and white broadcast media of the day. Following Garraway's effusive introduction, Wright interjected, don't make me blush, please. You wouldn't get the color on television. <laughs> June 3rd, 1956, and this is featured in the MoMA exhibit, and you have to go just to see this footage if you haven't seen it. Marked what was undoubtedly Wright's most surprising television appearance on everybody's favorite guessing game, What's My Line on CBS? When asked to enter and sign in, please, an elegant Wright took his time crafting his famous signature. To further identify him, the words world famous architect were also superimposed on the screen. The masked panel comprising actress Arlene Francis, ventriloquist Paul Winchell, journalist Dorothy Kilgallen, and actor Peter Lawford strive to reveal the mystery guest identity through questioning. Ultimately, Wright gave himself away. He could not hear the questions and noted, the sound goes out but does not come back. John Daly quickly said, oh, don't worry about that. We have a bit of an acoustics problem. When Wright said, yes, you do, Dorothy Kilgallen identified him. As Wright exited, he complimented the panel on being extraordinarily intelligent and told them about his new price tower rising on the Oklahoma prairie. Wright wasn't the only celebrity mystery guest that evening. The flamboyant pianist Liberace also appeared. I would love to have been in that green room. Right? 
undoubtedly Wright's most famous and provocative television appearance was on the September 1957 Mike Wallace interview on ABC. This is also on view at MoMA. A cutting edge show that asked penetrating questions. It was unrehearsed, uncensored, and unedited. There were no ground rules and no questions provided in advance. Wallace asked Wright to be on the show because he was a, quote, stormy petrel, an object of great admiration, and he had a richly original mind, end quote. Wallace was 39 and Wright was 90. The show began with a smoke-veiled Wallace saying, I'm Mike Wallace and this cigarette is Philip Morris, <laughs> plugging the program sponsor. The interview covered a range of topics including organic architecture, modern art, Charlie Chaplin, democracy, and sex. Wallace baited, Wright coolly responded. At one point, Wright turned the tables on Wallace. Do you even feel like apologizing for that thing in your hand? He said, pointing to the sponsor cigarette. Wallace quickly responded, no, not at all. I enjoy it, but later recalled that it was an awkward moment. Wright hastily retreated, saying, let's leave the cigarette smoker his solace. Wright himself smoked for about six months, so. Of the thousands of people he encountered in his decades as a television journalist, Wallace cited Wright as one of the most fascinating individuals he ever interviewed. The only person who matched him in supreme confidence and self-assurance was the Ayatollah Khomeini. As Wright stood his architectural ground with the press and his competitors, showcased luxury cars in a showroom, and his architectural wares in New York department stores, and hobnob with celebrity clients in person and on the air, his main purpose for establishing a residence in the city slowly began to rise uptown, a spiral <laughs> museum that would represent his only Manhattan structure and the culmination of his career. When Wright moved into his plaza suite, construction on the Guggenheim was on hold, waiting for the architect to secure the necessary building permits. Such obstacles had become commonplace, and many years had passed since his 1943 commission for the project, the first model for which is shown in this 1945 photograph. The reasons for the delays were numerous, including Guggenheim's belief that construction costs would drop following the war. His death in 1949 revised dismissal in 1952, the appointment of a trying new curator and director, James Johnson Sweeney, from the Museum of Modern Art, and questions about the museum's suitability to the architectural landscape of Fifth Avenue and the Upper East Side. 1953 saw a placeholder on the museum site, 60 years of living architecture, an exhibit of 800 right drawings and artifacts housed in a pavilion of the architect's design along with the complimentary Usonian Exhibition House. This is also shot by Ezra Stoller. A full-scale demonstration of Wright's affordable Usonian house building program. The exhibition was the largest to date devoted to one man, attracting 30,000 visitors in 52 days. The full story of the realization of the Guggenheim, all 16 years of it, is a long, convoluted, and complicated saga well beyond the scope of this talk and even our book, but I do want to just relay some highlights about it. In his prolonged struggle to realize the museum, Wright had a few key allies, New York power brokers all. First and foremost was Harry Guggenheim, shown here with his wife, Alicia Patterson. He became chair of the Guggenheim Foundation's Board of Trustees upon his uncle Solomon's death and was an unlikely successor. Neither an art connoisseur nor a patron, he was a man of wealth and diverse talents, a staunch Republican, ambassador to Cuba, early promoter of America's aviation industry, and owner of thoroughbred racehorses. Even so, he was determined to see his uncle's dream realized. Without Guggenheim's dedication and his astute aptitude for diplomacy and negotiation, the museum may not have been realized. He had a warm yet engaging relationship with Wright, once writing, Carito Francisco, his affectionate term for Wright, who tries me sorely but for whom I have great affection. Guggenheim's wife, Alicia, was successful in her own right, and she used her clout as publisher of Long Island's Newsday to promote and support Wright and the museum project. Wright also had the support of his cousin by marriage, Robert Moses, the city's parks commissioner, <laughs> among other titles. Believed by many to be the most powerful man in New York. In 1955, with the museum's construction on hold, the architect appealed to his powerful, quote, cousin Bob, end quote. No fan of modern architecture, Moses responded. I don't personally like either the museum or what's going into it, but we'll help some good friends in a dubious enterprise because they are friends and for no other reason. 
help he did cutting through bureaucratic red tape and issuing an ultimatum to the current building commission. Damn it, get a permit for Frank. I don't care how many laws you have to break. The permit was issued in March 1956, and ground was finally broken on August 16th of that year. Wright was a frequent visitor to the Guggenheim site. I really like this photograph personally. He's clearly in his element at long last. Supervising his assisting apprentices and the museum's complicated construction. He always brought his razor sharp vision to bear in the process, able to see what others could not. When the building was merely a deep hole in the ground, he gestured with his cane to the sky and commented to his book publisher, Ben Rayburn, a magnificent building, isn't it, Ben? The museum was a structure about which New Yorkers and the world were intensely curious. Descriptors for the rising spiral abounded, including a beehive, cupcake, bobsled course, giant jello mold, and an old-fashioned washing machine, but also ahead of its time. In September 1957, Wright toured the unfinished building with New York Times critic Aileen Saarinen, wife of Arrow. He discussed his snail-like structure with her and boldly proclaimed, here in the Guggenheim, you will see 20th century arts and architecture in their true relation. But that point was debatable, particularly when it came to the opinion of director Sweeney, imported from his job at MoMA and shown here with Wright at the 60 Years Exhibition. Wright was locked at odds with Sweeney for years over design issues and rising costs, as well as the architect's ideas about the proper display of art about which the artistic community and the city itself also expressed skepticism. In the end, Sweeney was the victor on nearly all counts. On October 21st, 1959, the building that would make the Metropolitan Museum look like, according to Wright, an outdated stone quarry <laughs> open to the public. Sadly, Wright did not live to see this day. He died six months earlier on April 17th, 1959. Devotees, detractors, and the curious flocked to see the remarkable new show place for non-objective art. And everyone had an opinion about the building, critical or otherwise. Reactions ranged from shocked disapproval to awed admiration, and questions were raised. Was it a monument or a museum? Was it about architecture or art? Times critic Ada Louise Huxtable lauded its luminous, soaring space. The Herald Tribune called it the most beautiful building in America. But the AIA Journal criticized the building for being distinctly out of place. Perhaps harshest of all was the judgment of Wright's longtime friend and sometime critic, Lewis Mumford, who took Wright's building to task for turning its back on Central Park, calling it the bitterest pill. But none of this commentary would have concerned Wright, who had once remarked to a colleague in regard to the museum, they will still be trying to figure this one out a thousand years from now. <laughs> The one fact about which there was no debate was that the building instantly became an iconic symbol of New York to its citizens and the world. Harry Guggenheim identified another important aspect of the building, the fact that Wright revolutionized the concept of what a museum was and could be by building, quote, an extraordinarily personal statement in the middle of a conformist city, end quote. A groundbreaking concept in 1959, it began the trend toward destination museums designed by high-profile architects. Museums as art that are inextricably linked to their creators, such as Breuer's former Whitney Museum of 1966, Pays East Building of the National Gallery, 1978, and Gary's Guggenheim Museum here in Bilbao, 1997. At the museum's opening day dedication, Moses reflected on his cousin, after some 90 years, his body wore out, but his mind was undiminished to the end, and his youthful crusading spirit will surely live, for no man of talent was ever less awed by his enemies or more certain of artistic resurrection. For much of his life, New York was an antagonist for Wright, and he remained a critic of it until the very end. Yet during his last five years, he also called Manhattan home, unabashedly loved living at its Plaza Hotel. To be certain, his relationship with the city was rich and complex, quixotic and mercurial, combative and conciliatory. In this context, it is fitting that his only freestanding building realized in Manhattan would not only be a bold and defiant personal statement, but would also become an enduring, instantly recognizable symbol of the city he loved to hate. After his death, his wife, Old Gavana, instructed John de Coven Hill to inventory the Plaza Suites' contents and then dismantle it. 
Although some effects remain in the collection of the Frank Lloyd Wright archives, many of the items were sold by Olga Vanna in the ensuing years. Wright left his suite for the last time on January 27, 1959, about 50 years ago. In a 1957 interview with television journalist Alastair Cook, Wright said, I consider myself a success only insofar as my life is useful, revealing, and rewarding to my kind. Who knows who is a success until long after the circumstances? Success is measured not in ordinary terms, but what will transpire 50 years later. So 50 years from now, you will know whether or not I am a successful person. The 10th anniversary edition of our book, which we have available tonight, includes a postscript about Wright's built legacy in a changing New York, reporting what's transpired regarding his work here in the last decade. I'll give you a very brief update, and you can read it for yourself. The Great Recession slowed construction down to a crawl nationwide, but our city rebounded more quickly than other urban centers, with commercial real estate deals reaching their pre-recession peak by 2015. Seemingly a positive, this recovery also came with a price, as numerous historic buildings and interiors were lost or altered in the greatest and greediest mouth in the world, as Wright had termed New York, some of his own work included. Since Wright's departure from the plaza in 1959, there have been many changes. Elad bought the hotel for $675 million in 2004 and began a $450 million renovation in 2005. 282 guest rooms and suites were retained for the hotel, and the remainder were converted to 181 private residences. Furnishings and artifacts were sold off. A highlight of the restoration that was the original glass ceiling of the Palm Court, which during Wright's lifetime, you see that here, was sacrificed for air conditioning units. And in 1953, he told the New Yorker, the little devil's already wrecked the Palm Court, but I saved the Oak Room and the Dining Room. In July 2005, the Oak Room and the Dining Rooms and other public rooms were designated by the New York Landmarks Commission and thus protected during a renovation. As for Wright's suite, all vestiges of his elegant redesign vanished long ago. At last report, the suite spaced, advertised as a place where you can sleep in the very same apartment once occupied by the legendary architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, was on the market for $26 million. The Guggenheim underwent a $29 million restoration, perhaps most notably of its extensive concrete. And that was completed in 2008. It was designated a National Historic Landmark. To mark its 50th anniversary in 2009, the exhibit Frank Lloyd Wright from Within Out for Outward was mounted, becoming the highest attended exhibition in the museum's history. That same year, the Wright Restaurant opened in the museum. The Guggenheim and nine other Wright design buildings are awaiting renewed consideration for UNESCO's World Heritage List. Wright's only permanent commercial project in New York the Hoffman Automobile Showroom was sold by Max Hoffman to Mercedes-Benz three years after its 1955 opening. The brand occupied it through two moderate renovations before vacating to larger quarters on 11th Avenue in 2012. Several months after the luxury dealer's move, despite advocacy efforts by the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy and others to save it, the showroom was lost to the wrecking ball. And I walked by and saw it, and my heart was broken. I just happened to see it. The fate of historic interiors is always precarious, especially in New York. Made aware of Mercedes' moving plan in June 2012, the Conservancy sent a formal request for evaluation of the showroom that August to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. The commission called the building owners and on March 22, 2013, informed them of its interest in designating the showroom as the city's 115th interior landmark and followed up with a letter on March 25th. On March 28th, the owners applied to the Department of Buildings for a demolition permit. Permission was granted, and the space was demolished the next week. More than three years later, that space still sits vacant. The Cass House was Wright's only residential project in New York, and it was designated a New York City landmark in 1990. The building was sold twice, the second time to Frank and Jean Critella. They are founders of the area firm Landmark Hospitality. Frank grew up on Staten Island and shared a school bus with the two cast daughters, so he knew them. He was watching what proved to be a prophetic episode of Jeopardy when he learned his offer on the house had been accepted. The question was, America's favorite architect, and the answer was Frank Lloyd Wright. The Cretillas have made some needed alterations in the house, but are actively dedicated to preserving their treasured home. 
and finally, the Franklin Wright archives. Despite some losses, the city gained a priceless aspect of Wright's legacy in 2012, the majority of his archives. The Museum of Modern Art and Columbia University's Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library acquired more than 23,000 architectural drawings, approximately 40 large-scale models, some 44,000 photographs, 600 manuscripts, and more than 300,000 pieces of office and personal correspondence from the Franklin Wright Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona. Wright's papers are now housed at Avery, while the models reside at MoMA. Some personal ephemera, such as Wright's hats, canes, pencils, straight out of his drawer. You can put your hand on them. The day he died, they just preserved them. And artwork remain at Taliesin West and can be seen on their private collections tour. There's some irony that New York, the city Wright loved to hate, is now the primary repository of his intellectual property. <laughs> More than a half century later, his opinions, designs, and ideas are once again in residence and causing a stir in our city, circumstances he would likely protest but appreciate immensely. And before closing, I want to mention that the renowned Design at All Scales magazine, Metropolis, is the official publication of Frank Lloyd Wright 150, celebrating his 150th birthday. And its July-August issue featured an extensive special section about Wright. Susan Sanazi, who's the magazine's rock star director of design innovation, is here. Are there any back issues we can order, Susan? <laughs> We're going to come and talk to you about that afterward. Congratulations. This summer, I was pleased to pen an online series for Metropolis on the topics that are listed here, based on unpublished interviews and other content from my book, including my experience interviewing Mike Wallace, which was top five moments of my life. If you have interest, just go to the site and search my last name and they will come up. Thank you so much.